directed by James Borlay. Uh, so we do have tickets uh, on sale for that as well. Uh, so definitely come and check that out. I think that is a wrap on all of our announcements today. So today's speaker is Patrick Jones. Patrick is a member of the Camp Chase Fife and Drums, where he has studied and transcribed uh, percussion notation from various historical fife and drum manuals. He served primarily as drum sergeant for the past 10 years. Along with Camp Chase, he also performs with and instructs the Fort Pitt Fife and Drum Corps. Restoring historic drums and building authentic reproductions is also a passion of his. Through his website, Rudiments and Rope, Patrick provides educational information about historical drums and their makers. Patrick has taught fifth grade for 19 years in the Upper St. Clair School District, where for 14 years he also instructed the school's drum line. Ladies and gentlemen, Patrick Jones. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for having me. Thank you, John, for uh, the wonderful introduction. And um, he told me that I have a three hour time limit today. So they're gonna lock the doors back there and you're all stuck here for the next three hours. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, I get to occasionally give talks on probably my favorite topic, which is um, drumming and fifing during the American Civil War. And um, today we're going to kind of go through a whole gamut of fife and drum history with an emphasis, obviously, on the Civil War. But it's also good to paint a little bit more of a background um, picture of the fife and drum and its use in the military um, in the United States. Um, because I have a teacher background and that's what I do every day, um, I have kind of objectives up here for us. So you kind of know what to expect, because I feel like it's always good to kind of have an idea of what to expect. Um, as we get started here. So a couple of things that you're going to be learning today. Number one is become more knowledgeable about construction methods, materials, and makers of 19th century drums. Um, all the drums that I have up here, aside from this one in the center, are all original drums. Um, so if you, at the end, if you want to come up and look at them and talk to me about them, I'm more than happy to talk your ear off about anything that's up here. Um, also, we are going to evaluate the role of field musicians uh, during the American Civil War. Uh, what was their purpose? What roles did they play um, in the camps, um, which were they mainly were? Engage the audience, which is all of you, of course, in a uh, visual and auditory journey of martial music. So I'm definitely going to be doing some playing here. And then inspire others to become passionate about historical rope tension drumming and martial music. So lots of objectives, but it will hopefully go by pretty quickly and be fun and informative for everybody. So a little bit of background about me before we kind of go on our journey here. I grew up in Bethel Park, so I'm very local. Um, I actually did uh, a few things down here in Carnegie when I was very young, just getting into um, history. And um, I, I marched in the Carnegie Memorial Day Parade one year um, when I was 10. Um, and that was the first thing that I'd ever done Civil War wise. And uh, that was a pretty cool experience. And uh didn't know a lot of the, the guys that I was marching with. Um, some of them are still around, but um, that kind of really got me started drumming in the age of 10 and 11. I was very, very interested in drumming when I was younger, and I didn't know what rudimental drumming was or anything, and I just wanted to learn how to Civil War drum, which isn't really a term. But um, what I did is uh, my parents got in contact with a, a guy named John Buswell who worked down at Drum World. He owned Drum World. I started taking lessons from him and then very quickly started to get even more and more interested in drumming um, in history and learning all the different things that are in these manuals that we're going to be talking about. Um, as I got older, um, I started to do fife and, or not fife and drum corps, but drum and bugle corps, which is a whole different beast. It's kind of like a marching band on steroids. And uh, you're running around a field and you're traveling all summer and you're on buses. And I did that all through college um, up until I graduated college in 2003 and uh, graduated from Edinburgh with a degree in education, a minor in music, and then got my job at St. Clair and then went full circle back to the historical thing, got in contact with Camp Chase Fife and Drums, um, who were in the movie Gods and Generals and Gettysburg and any Fife and Drum you hear in um, those those movies, it's all, it's all them. And um, got in contact with them and started to play with them and then been doing that ever since. So that was kind of my whole wraparound. And then once I got into Camp Chase, I started to go down the rabbit holes that we all know, you know, what's in this manual, what's in this manual, how are these drums made, where they get these things. And that's kind of where life has taken me to develop a, a website based on, you know, who are the drum makers, what are these drums made out of, how can you identify them, um, just basically for fun, 
and also for purposes of posterity and understanding where all these guys were um, because they're making drones by the thousands. Um, so that's some background about me. Now what I wanted to do is give you a little bit of background about fifes and drums, particularly the drum in the United States. So in the armies of the Swiss and the French and the British, um, the fife and drum was well documented, well used, uh, probably by the Swiss first. And then of course, everybody had to copy each other. Um, but as fife and drum you know, developed in those European nations, it followed them here to the colonies. And we actually have documentation of a drummer named Nicholas Scott who came over uh, and was in Jamestown. So the very first established you know, colony here in uh, North America, there was a drummer, which made sense because they had military men and they had to defend against attacks. And you know, um, the militia regulations at the time allowed for drummers and things like that. Um, 17th century drums though are a little bit different as you can see from this painting, stained glass. Um, from England, the drum is very big, um, much bigger than these drums. It was carried very high under your armpit, kind of like the Ohio State Marching Band does today. Um, and it was played very differently. But we do have tons and tons of uh, evidence of the drum being used um, as the primary instrument all the way back to 1607. The Plymouth Colony also had drummers. Um, Isaac D. Raziers, who is a um, uh, secretary of the New Netherland Colony, talks about the assemble by the beat of the drum, each with his musket or firelock in front of the captain's door. So they talk specifically about the drum being used to regulate the military movements of the militias, even in 1627. And you also have in the logs of the cargo that is being carried uh, on the Mayflower, a trumpet and a drum. So these are all important things that they are bringing over with them because they were that important to the military at that time. I do love this painting by Don Triani, who is a famous military artist, as probably you many know, titled The First Muster, Massachusetts Bay Colony. Um, one thing that many people don't know is Miles Standish, um, who was in Queen Anne's Army, was a drummer as a young boy. And he was in charge of the training of the militia, um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. You can see the circle there. You see the drummer sitting off to the side with a very large drum. So this was used very, very, um, you know, throughout the earliest parts of the United States and what became the United States later on. Now, as time goes on, you see this being used in New England specifically because that's where all these you know, towns first developed. And they're gonna use them in different ways. They're not gonna be using a drum just for military purposes, but they're gonna be using them for all these other purposes, calling people to Sunday worship, town meetings, auction sales, uh, business announcements, the term drumming up business was literally from a drummer who was playing a drum to call people to come and, you know, assemble for various announcements and things like that. Um, even leading somebody to be hanged. Um, you can see in this image of uh, Mary Dyer on her way to the scaffold. Um, there's a group of drummers surrounding her. Mary Dyer was a Quaker who kept on going back to Puritan, Massachusetts, and finally they said, you know, we're going to hang you, and they did. And as she was walking, she was trying to call out and yell out things about the religion, and they didn't want anybody to hear that, so they used drummers to drown out the sound of her voice. So not always the most exciting and, uh, you know, flattering way of using the drum, but still a very interesting way to show that the drum is, you know, very important and used in a variety of ways. Now, no matter what time period we're talking about, whether it's the 17th century, 18th century, or the 19th century, your drum construction is going to be very similar. Um, it's all natural components, of course. You're going to have steam bent shells and you're going to have steam bent hoops. Um, sometimes they would have been maybe put in water, but steam bending ends up being the predominant way of bending wood. You see a lot of furniture makers, cabinet makers, and things like that doing all of those things already. Um, you know, and it's talked about in various historical writings. So it's it's easy to understand why they would be doing it with drums and hoops. You're going to have calfskin drum heads. You're going to have sheepskin uh, drum heads. Um, you're going to have gut snares, which is sheep intestine, um, which is common to be used on various stringed instruments of the time period. As we get into the 1800s, banjos um, are going to have gut strings um, as well. Um, hemp rope is the predominant rope that you would see um, on ships of that time period, and you see it for sale pretty regularly. Um, linen is not 
you know, something that you would see. Hemp was the predominant growth that you would see, whether it was three strands, five strand, four strand, seven strand, um, it all depends. And even today, trying to get hemp rope is very, very difficult because like most things, um, they don't let it grow long enough. The fibers in the plant aren't long enough. So when they make the rope, um, the rope is not the same quality. It's not as fine as you see on some of the original drums. So even when I make reproductions of these, it's very difficult to source certain materials because they're just not made the same way. Even finding a drum shell is very difficult because the trees grow so much uh, you know, longer. 200 years ago, you had old growth forests full of trees with really tight grain that bent really easily. Today, it's very difficult to find trees that are that old. So even getting wood, the right diameter and things like that um, are very hard to find today. But obviously back then there was plenty of natural resources. And then you have leather braces, which are going to be used to tension the drum. And those are made out of leather and there's different variety of shapes. You have square styles, you have heart shaped styles, you have rounded styles, some with fancy paint edges, um, but pretty much that's the basic drum in a nutshell. Um, for 18th century, 19th century uh, music. Now, if we take a look back at the 18th century and we talk about the American Revolution, um, drumming and fifing was very poor. And George Washington writes about this um, very early on. You can see here from his general orders, October 27, 1776. He talks about the constant beating of drums on all occasions is very improper. And there should be no drum, but on the parade in the main guard, all fatigue parties to march with the fife and no drum to beat on an account after retreat beating, but by special order. So what we start to see here and why that quote is so important is we start to see that Washington is taking the lead to try to get some semblance of order. And he's trying to organize and almost, you know, give orders about what should be doing because the fife and drum and music was kind of in disarray. There were no military manuals over here in the United States at this time period. Um, a lot of that military manual idea came from Europe, but you have people now doing things, the militias, kind of on their own. So Washington realizes early on, we need to organize this. We need to structure this so that everybody's doing the same thing, okay? And that's what we're gonna be leading towards. Um, in the winter camp of 76 and 77, it says the music of the army being in general very bad. Um, it is expected that the drum and fife majors exert themselves to improve it or they will be reduced in their extraordinary pay taken from them. Um, so you had maybe many musicians, but they didn't know what they were doing. Um, they weren't playing very well together. They were not able to do what they were supposed to do. And as we get into it, their job is to regulate the duty throughout the entire day. So Washington sees this and he what he ends up doing is we're going to see that he puts in charge Lieutenant John Highwell and he is going to basically be um, the organizer of the music in the military towards the end of the American Revolution. Um, and we can see here on June 4, 77, the Reveille is beaten at daybreak, the troop at eight o'clock in the morning and the retreat at sunset. So we start to see specific times given here also, which are going to carry over into the American Civil War as well. So on August 19th, 1778, we have Lieutenant Highwell, who was Colonel Crane's regiment of artillery, is appointed the inspector and superintendent of music in the army. And the great thing that we have from Highwell is we have his music returns. And all these copies of the music returns show that he is taking a very step-by-step -step process of figuring out what instruments do we have? Are they in need of repair? Um, do we have enough of A, B, and C to equip the musicians that we have? Um, and that's what we start to see Highwell doing. Um, and we also start to see more organization happen within the music. Um, we start to see that there's more instruction. We start to see him ordering books, blank music books. So what they're starting to do is do more standardization to what is being played, whether it's you know duty calls, music, um, and so forth. That's what we really start to see here towards the end of the American Revolution. There wasn't any of this here in the colonies in the beginning of the revolution, but now we start to see a standardization. And that's very important because now we're writing things down. Now we're saying this is what is going to happen in the American military. And in 79, we know that Friedrich von Steuben 
publishes his regulations in order for discipline. And there's a whole section here on drum music and what is to be played and what is prescribed to be um, played. He talks about the daily duty. Um, it's written out in the descriptions. It's not written out in actual music notation, but he does have specific instructions on what is to be played and when it is to be played. And that's the first time that we see here uh, in the United States, something written out for the musicians to do following the arms. So the reason I told you that is because there took some time to get to some standardization with the music in the military in the United States. And by the time the Civil War rolls around, there's a lot of standardization. There's a lot of books that we're going to talk about that um, are available for musicians. So to start with the Civil War part of the presentation, I like this quote from uh, F.H. Buckman. And he's kind of talking about the playing style of the musicians in the Civil War. And he said that he remembered a drummer boy whose arms were playing all about him like forked lightning, his drumsticks rattling down upon the doomed head like half a dozen magnificent hailstorms. Each combination of sounds welling up and flying off the distinct pedals, peals of thunder with no room for reverberation between the claps. So in my mind, when I read that, I think that this guy is playing as loud as possible. And I love that because being a drummer, we all want to just play as loud as possible. And this quote tells us to play as loud as possible. There's another funny thing that I found um, from one of the um, fife and drum manuals that was being presented to the military in 1855 by a gentleman named Kleinhans. And he was presenting his manual to be adopted by the United States. And part of his manual um, had an indication for when you play softer and when you play louder. And as they were reviewing, and this is all written down, as they were reviewing it, they said there was no need for that because everything should be played loud. <laughs> so when we talk about music in the American Civil War, I kind of like to split this into two different classifications. You have bands, which would be brass bands here consisting of brass horns, drums, and cymbals. Um, their purpose, obviously, performing concerts, entertainment, morale on the march, uh, military ceremonies. And... The part about brass bands that's interesting is that regimental bands get disbanded after General Orders 91 in July of 1862. Um, one thing that was happening is they were paying these brass bands a lot of money. And after about a year and a half or so of, you know, shelling out thousands and thousands of dollars to these brass bands, um, the War Department said, we can't afford this. We can't continue this. This is unsustainable. So what they do is they say, we're going to take regimental brass bands. We're going to muster everybody out. And they're only going to be allowed to have brigade bands. Now, of course, some officers out of their own pockets, they're going to pay to have brass bands continue to be in the regiment because they knew the, you know, um, having these bands and having this music was a great morale booster. Um, they knew that it was good for the soldiers and it was also show. Um, they'd like to be able to tell their friend, oh, brass, brass band is the best. How's your brass band? Oh, you don't have one? That was kind of what they were doing back then. So to have a brass band with your regiment, it was cool to have. Um, but for most of the regiments, they lost their brass bands who were professional musicians. Um, they got paid as well. Um, the uh, band, the, the um, principal musicians and chief musicians, they got paid a whole lot of money um, and they just had to stop. So you really start to see brass bands, the number of them diminish after July of 1862. And that takes us to why the fife and drum and the field music is so important because field music is going to be the ones that regulate the duty throughout the entire day. So when we talk about field musicians, we're talking about drummers and fifers and buglers. Um, the purpose is to perform duty calls throughout the day. That's going to regulate everything that happens in camp. Um, that is going to be their main duty. Um, a lot of the idea of fife and drum playing on a battlefield, um, there's not really many accounts of that. And if you think about it, it makes sense. If you have thousands and thousands of guns going off, you have military um, artillery exploding, you're not going to hear a fife and drum at all. Um, you're not going to be able to use commands on the battlefield, really. There's really not a lot of uh, historical evidence to show that that was happening. What the field musicians were usually doing on the battlefield is helping the doctors. Um, they were stretcher bearers. There's many, many, many written accounts of guys doing that. Um, as soon as the battle was going to start, they would get you know relieved to go help um, with all the doctors and the nurses and taking men and things like that. So that's really where they were um, on the battlefield. Now, I don't feel that that diminishes 
their responsibility or their jobs within the context of the military, because if it wasn't for them, their whole duty of the entire day wouldn't really be able to happen. Because if you think about trying to wake somebody up in the morning, I know I have a 13 year old and I teach 10, 11 year olds. And I always ask them, I said, how long did it take you to get up this morning? How many times did your mom and dad come in and wake you up? How many times did you hit the snooze, you know, button? And they're like, oh, it took me, you know, forever. I said, now imagine trying to get a thousand guys up. I said, you couldn't do it. So that's why I think the music, especially the field music, is so integral and important in the military. So a little bit about organization of field music um, within a regiment. So each company was allotted two field musicians. Now, in a perfect world, you would have a fifer and a drummer. Because then when those companies would form together in a regiment, you would have a nice balance of 10 fifers and 10 drummers. This very rarely happened. Um, we definitely see photographic evidence of much smaller, especially as the war goes on, uh, much smaller fife and drum regiments and you were fighting drum corps as you can see from these pictures here um one of them is in ohio iowa i think the bottom one is ohio uh, yeah iowa and you can see that there are only three fifers in the front um and there are four drummers and one bass drum so that whole idea of having a nice balance of 10 and 10 not really accurate the top is the same except there's three fifers and we have i think about six or so snare drummers and then a bass drummer I just found literally yesterday um, 13 drummers and two fifers, a uh, regimental drum corps from the uh, National Archives. So that's a terrible balance because you would never hear any of the fifers. But that didn't necessarily matter because the drum was the primary instrument. And the drum could do the entire duty by itself, which you could not say the same thing for the fife. So you're also going to see a lot of that um, throughout the time period where the drum is the main instrument. Now, before the Civil War, there were schools of uh, practice, as they were called, where they would actually train field musicians. And uh, one of them is in Governor's Island, New York. Um, some of you may have been there. Uh, it's still an island that you can go and take a tour of. You would have to take a ferry across um, to the harbor. And we have a really good account of what it was like there for these musicians because a gentleman named Augustus Myers was there when he was, I think, 12 years old. And he writes 10 years in the ranks. He enlisted in 1854. And he talks all about his life there, learning how to play the fife. He talks about his teachers um, who were Hankey, Sergeant Hankey and Sergeant Moore. He ends up being a fifer there. And uh, one of the funny things he talks about is when Sergeant Hankey would take his fife away and he would try to play something to teach him. Sergeant Hankey always had a big uh, chaw of tobacco in his mouth. And he said when he'd hand him his fife back, he'd have to wipe down the fife because there'd just be this tobacco all over it and spit. Mm -hmm. So we can reenact that one time before. <laughs> now, the other uh, school of practice was in the Newport Barracks uh, in Kentucky, right across from Cincinnati. Um, there's really nothing of that left there. Um, I've been down there for uh, Tall Stacks, which is a big riverboat festival. And that picture of the... Um, that markers pretty much all the remains of the Newport Barracks. But interestingly enough, in a later fife and drum manual, there are two marches, one called Governor's Island and one called Newport Quickstep. So kind of like a tip of the hat to these schools of practice, there were tunes named after them later on. And that takes us to the camp duty. Now, like we talked about earlier on, um, in the American Revolution, there was very few written um, you know, resources. I think there are three manuscripts that survived from the 18th century from the United States showing anything that they played on the drum. Um, by the time the Civil War rolls around, obviously printing has gone way far from what it started as in the 1700s, and there are all sorts of music manuals um, that are printed in the fat by the thousands. Um, three of them are up here that you can see, probably the most popular. You have the Bruce and Emmett Drummers and Fifers Guide, uh, which is on the right-hand side. Um, the author of that, one of them being Dan Decatur Emmett, who was a very famous minstrel performer. He was also a fifer um, in the American military before the Civil War broke out. And uh, that's probably the most well-known fife and drum manual that we have in existence today. The other one is by a guy named Colonel H.C. Hart. Um, and his fife and drum manual is, uh, I'll talk about it in a little bit. I'll show you some pictures of it. It is written in very strange uh, notation. Uh, with triangles and little symbols and things like that. Nothing like we would see modern day music. 
The other one, we have the Army Regulations for Drum, Fife, and Bugle by William Nevins. Um, there were three or four different variations of this particular manual printed. And the nice thing is about these manuals is there is definitely a connection. There's some identified manuals to specific musicians during the Civil War. Um, so by this time, you did have a very literate society. Um, you had people who were learning how to read music. You had people who not knew how to read music. And these books were meant to be a lot of them self-instructors. And that means that, you know, from an advertising standpoint, if you went and bought this book, in essence, you should be able to read it. You should be able to teach yourself how to play. Um, and that was a, a good way of trying to get people to pick up this military music easier. And that was an advertising point for them. This is the best one. This is the one with the most easy um, notation. This is the one that's going to help you learn the fastest. And uh, we start to see a lot of those, um, that wording within these drum manuals and uh, manuscripts. But going along with our idea of the camp duties, and most of us have probably heard, you know, the Reveille in three camps before, um, but I like to talk about it here because this is, in essence, what the field musician's job was, to regulate the daily routine of the soldier. And, of course, the first thing that the musicians would do when they wake up in the morning is they would sound drummer's call, which would be a call to gather all of the musicians together because they needed to start the duty. And the first thing that they played in the morning was three camps. Now, this notation here is from Nevin's manual. And if you look at it, we have a bunch of weird things going on. You have notes going up, you have notes going down. And it might look confusing to anybody who is uh, used to seeing modern music notation, but it's actually very simple because the notes that are facing up are the left hand and the notes that are facing down are the right hand. So what they're doing is they're giving you the stickings. They're telling you, here's the notes that you play, here's the stickings. The weird thing about these manuals though, some of them is that they do not have major markings like we would in modern day music. So you would almost need to have somebody teaching you how to play these along with this because it would be very difficult to know how to put all these notes together because there are no rests either. Usually in modern music, you play a little bit and where you stop playing, there's a rest. You don't have any of that in this music. It's just a constant notation. So you would need to have either the fife there with you, or you would need to have, um, you know, somebody instructing you on what to do. But this would be the very first thing that soldiers heard in the morning um, in order to get them out of bed. And Reveille consisted of 10 or 12 tunes, depending on the manual you were looking at. And by the end, it was expected that all the soldiers would be turned out in company streets to take one of the three daily roll calls. And um, that's why it was 10 or 12 minutes. And I always say that it was like the alarm clock that you could never shut off. And there's all sorts of stories of guys throwing things at the musicians from their tents because they knew that if they, you know, once they stopped playing, they had to be out there to the cold morning at 5 a.m. So what I'll do here is I'll play for you just this first, um, this first part of the revelry, um, which is three camps. And if you can imagine, there's only going to be one of me here. If you can imagine 12 or 13 of these drummers together, um, it would be extremely, extremely loud. And when I go over to the drum, I have to tension up my drum here because it's not tuned right now. So what I'm, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to push down leather ears all around my drum. And what that's going to do is that's going to pull those counter hoops together, which is going to tighten the drum head. So I'm going to do that first, and then I'll perform the three camps and have a couple other tunes or duty calls that I'm going to play here for you as well.
Thank you. Hopefully everybody heard that. <laughs> so that would be your very first duty call of the morning. And of course, that would go on and on, 10 or 12 tunes, 12, 13 minutes, uh, just in order to get the guys out of bed. And that would be the full complement of fife and drum. So that would be the entire fife and drum core playing. Um, then usually what would happen is you would have one duty drummer and one duty fifer um, that would be stationed near the adjutant's tent. And their job was to, throughout the day then, um, play all the other calls that were needed, you know, on command. Um, they, they weren't necessarily, you know, they didn't know what they were going to tell them to do, but they would be, you know, oh, we need to play, um, you know, we have a guard mounting. Um, we're going to be doing this. We are going to have, um, we need to call officers. We need to call first sergeants over. And the duty drummers would only be, you know, one drummer, one fighter. They would have to be ready right there and then to play these things, to call all of the other officers and do all the other things they needed to do. So the, the fact that they had music available there, other than just going and shouting out, meeting people, which we know is not very advantageous. So you would need somebody there to regulate all of those things. So of course, as the day goes on, one of the most favorite calls that we see is breakfast call and any call for food. And uh, this you can see is a little bit different. This notation, this is from uh, Bruce and Emmett Strummer's and Piper's Guide. 1862. Um, this is really where we start to see um, a good tie to modern day music. And they even score it for us. So not only do we have the drum music on the bottom of the staff, but we also have on the upper one, the fife music, and they have all of it matching up with the various measures. So you can see very clearly how this all goes together. Um, and this was, again, a duty call that dates back, you know, probably well before the time of the American Civil War or somewhere, um, probably in Europe, but it's called Peas Upon a Trencher. And again, you're going to hear this totally different sounding type of call. Um, and that was the idea is these calls varied so much in, in the way that they sounded and these guys would pick up. I mean, if you're hearing this every single day, I've heard people try to say before like, oh, how would they know what call meant what? I'm like, when you hear these every single day, month after month, you're going to know what that call is, especially the food calls. Those guys knew as soon as they heard the first two notes, they're like, oh, you're going to get dinner. I know, I mean, everybody would know those calls first. So this one, Peas Upon a Trencher, sounds very, very different than what we heard previously with um, the uh, Revel. Could I move it over here a little bit closer to our Zoom? I think surprisingly they could not hear that. Yeah. Is that good? Or, oh, you want me to go like in front of the food? Okay. I can go anywhere. Is that good? So this is peas upon a tree. So you can hear a little bit different, um, but different enough that everybody would know what that call was. And kind of going along with the whole kick of food, we have the dinner call, the old, the roast beef of old England, obviously comes from England. Uh, roast beef, um, very popular call with the soldiers. Um, a little note here, a lot of times when I do these presentations, I do them for musicians, so there's a lot of musical terminology in here. And one question that I get pretty often is, you know, how do you know any accenting or how do you know, you know, exactly um, what to play? Are you just making it up? I'm not making it up. Um, the one nice thing we have from some earlier manuals in 1810 is they were written all in words. Um, and the accenting is actually explicitly set. So this is from David Hazeltine's 1810 manual. It talks specifically about how to perform a double drag. And they say it is beat by giving two light strokes with one hand and a hard stroke with the other twice over. Then one hard stroke with the hand that gave the light stroke, shifting from hand to hand every drag. So we know what the accenting is. Um, it's not that you know we're just making it up, but there's a, a history there with the style of rudimental drumming 
so that you can know and interpret the accenting, even though if you notice in this music, there are no markings above or below the notes to indicate any sort of accent. We know what they are based on earlier manuals. So you have to do a little bit of digging. Um, but the other thing is, is that is all passed on also through the military. Um, so when these guys are learning, say at Governor's Island or Newport Barracks, if they're not accenting or playing things right, they're taught how to, they're being instructed how to. Um, but I'll play for you the uh, dinner call, Roast Beef of Old England. Um, and this is another tune, obviously, that was played every single day um, for the soldiers to assemble to eat dinner. Is that okay, that one? Where's the... So again, what you see is you can see some, you know, pretty distinct differences between just those three calls. Um, and that was the idea. And then obviously when you had a fight to it and I had a little bit of a melody, it became a lot easier. Um, aside from all of those types of calls for dinner, you had things like pioneers call, um, which or sometimes known as fatigue call. And this one always makes me laugh because the description of this is it's used to um, have the soldiers turn out to clean up the company streets, take out trash and things like that. And you also notice up here is um, also to drum disorderly women out of camp. So that always makes me laugh when I read that. I'm wondering that must have been a problem then. <laughs> There's a specific call for that. So that would be a pioneer's call. So you have all of these duty calls that are being performed throughout the day, um, like I've said a hundred times, regulating the, the routine of the soldier. And then, of course, you have popular music. Um, a lot of the popular music of this time period um, comes from the minstrel show. And you see a lot of carryover from the minstrel show into fife and drum, um, minstrel performers who are also musicians in the military. And um, these are songs like, you know, what we would consider rock and roll today. Um, the minstrel show, as politically incorrect as a lot of the lyrics were, um, you know, it was very popular among pretty much everybody, um, the middle class of uh, the United States at that time. So you see this carryover of these particular tunes. Um, up here, you have two of them, Frog in the Well, um, which is sometimes known as Kimo Kaimo. Um, that was a very popular minstrel tune. You find itself in a fife and drum manual. And Old Zip Coon. Um, which is another very popular minstrel tune, um, finds its way into the fife and drum um, world. And uh, that always fascinates me because you have something like, you know, these, these troops that are going around the country playing. And from a standpoint of how am I going to sell this manual, I got to put some popular music in it that everybody knows. So not only are you seeing duty calls, and calls for, you know, going to get water and, you know, gathering wood, but you see lots of popular music. And we're going to see that this is important for morale on the march, um, you know, more than anything, because if you're marching 10 or 12 miles and it's hot or it's cold and your feet are sore, you know, I always tell my students, I'm like, can you imagine taking a trip down to South Carolina to Myrtle Beach, but you're not allowed to listen to the radio? And they're like, oh my gosh, that's awful. But now I gotta say, you're not allowed your cell phone. When I first started, you can't listen to radio. But now I'm like, you can't have your cell phone. They're like, oh, it's against the Geneva Convention. Um, but I, you know, if you think about that in terms of you know men marching, you're gonna need something to take your mind, obviously, off of that marching all day long, ten or twelve miles. So popular music, um, you know, such as the uh, these two tunes made their way into um, you know the fife and drum repertoire. And then we also have some cool instances here of specific tunes uh, being talked about on the march. So when we look at, you know, regimental histories, um, the story of our regiment of the 148th PA, there's actually three or four chapters written uh, about the drum corps of the 148th and the regimental history. Um, most of them are written by principal musicians. 
And um, they talk about specific tunes, you know, commencing with the Reveille and the Retreat and the Tattoo, which is all good and fine. Um, but then they talk about their other repertoire, which would be their marches and quick steps, like The Girl I Left Behind Me, uh, Larry O'Gaff, which is very popular Irish tune. We see a lot of Irish uh, music in the fife and drum repertoire also, because the mass, you know, uh, exodus of Irish from Ireland in the 1840s because of the famine, we see many of them um, coming over here, serving in the ranks, I'm sure, as many of you know, and the music that they brought with them was very good to play on the fife. So you hear a lot of, you know, lots and lots of Irish tunes being played on the fife um, throughout the American Civil War. Um, on, in particular, um, Rufus Dawes talks about in his uh, memoirs after the war service with the 6th Wisconsin. Um, he talks about as they are marching to the streets of Gettysburg, uh, they're going down the Emmitsburg Road and then they peel off and then they're going up towards uh, Seminary Ridge, as we probably most of us know. Um, he specifically states that here to make a show in the streets of Gettysburg, I brought our drum corps to the front, had the colors unfurled. The drum major, R.M. Smith, had begun to play the Campbells are coming. And it says the regiment had closed its ranks and swung into step when we first heard the cannon of the enemy firing on the cavalry of General Buford. Um, and the Campbells are coming is found in a couple different fife uh, and drum manuals as well. So that's kind of a cool tie that we have there. Uh, but it was definitely something that was popular on the march, maybe not necessarily in the in the midst of battle, but definitely on the march, we can see that. Now this takes us to drum makers. Um, and I basically like to talk a little bit about these guys because so many of their instruments are still in existence today. And uh, I love them. And that's why I have, I think, so many of them, because there's just something about them. I know that people collect all sorts of things, but my niche is obviously the, uh, the, the fife and drum stuff. So what was interesting about the Civil War, though, is that this is a time period when drum maker was a, a pretty popular and, um, you know, respected trade. Um, you know, along with cabinet makers and furniture makers, instrument makers were doing very, very well. And uh, you start to see, by the time of the Civil War, big contracts are being given for thousands of drums. Um, and that's a lot of money that the uh, War Department and the uh, Quartermaster is dishing out for drums. Um, and as you look at the prices of drums, as the war goes on, they increase little by little. Uh, but they're definitely making a very good living. So what we start to see is we start to see these uh, instrument makers coming from all different backgrounds. We start to see wood turners, now I'm a drum maker. Um, I made furniture, now I'm gonna make drums. So everybody's kind of jumping on the bandwagon, uh, you know, as in a manner of speaking, in order to make some money during the war. So you can see this in the quartermaster records. You see orders for drums complete. And basically that meant that you're gonna get drums, sticks, slings, a drum carriage, which is the brass carriage that has the drumstick holders in it. Um, and then they also call sacks. So some sort of sack to carry the drum in. Um, I think I've seen maybe two sacks in my entire life. If anybody has one, I'll be willing to take it off your hands. But, um, but that would be drums complete. And then of course, after the drums are complete, you have all sorts of issues with heads breaking and things falling apart. So you're gonna see parts for skins and sticks and cord, which is rope. Um, and when we think about drum making, there's four industrial centers that I think most of the drums came from, New York, Boston, Baltimore, and Philadelphia, um, which is not surprising because that's where you're gonna see a lot of military equipment coming out of um, also. Now in New York particular, these are the big names that are making drums. Richard Maine, William Kilborn uh, was a family business, successor to George Kilborn was his father. You have Alexander Rogers, you have William Tompkins, and then Paul Firth and Pond um, was a conglomeration, a corporation um, that worked together, printing, publishing music, um, and also selling instruments. Um, now I have a couple of those drums. I have a New York drum, that middle drum over there is a William Kilborn drum. What we start to see as you become obsessed with it, or I sometimes call it my sickness, um, as you become more knowledgeable about these drums, you start to see all of the finer detail work of how they were constructed. And a lot of times I can look at a drum immediately and just say it's from this place, it's from that maker, and so on and so forth. Um, and I won't bore you with all that minutia today. 
But um, afterwards, if you want to know, I can point out all the differences. Um, but the easiest way to tell who made a drum, because people ask me that, is to look through the vent hole. Um, there's obviously a little hole in that drum shell that lets air escape when you play on it. And a lot of times there's going to be a label inside. Um, if there's a label inside, then it's real easy to date that drum. So you go back to the business records, you can find when they were at that address. And because of construction techniques, you can figure out when that drum was made. Um, so New York drums are pretty specific. Um, it's easy to tell that. It's also easy to tell New York drums due to their eagles. Um, one of the things that I was talking to uh, Joan about earlier, um, which is another rabbit hole I went down, is um, the, the painting of the eagles. When you start to take a look at eagles, I can look at an eagle on a drum and say, maybe not the exact maker, but where it came from regionally. Um, because they were doing different eagles in Boston than they were doing in Philadelphia, than they were doing in New York, than they were doing in Baltimore, because local artists were doing that. So when you start to see these eagles, it's very easy to say that drum came from this place, it came from that place, um, and so on and so forth. So when you take a look at a drum, the drum itself can tell you an entire story um, without even touching it, without even realizing that somebody carried this. I can already, you know, you could already start to see that there was a lot that went into making that drum. Now in Boston, you have guys like John C. Haynes, Asa and Ira White, and Elias Howe. Um, they're making drums in a very specific way. Um, you can see that up here, the label um, on the bottom right-hand corner, that's a uh, Boston drum manufacturer by Elias Howe. That's a pretty large label. Um, some labels were pretty small. I've seen humongous labels like this. And then I've seen a small label put right in the center of it, which means that somebody probably had it, resold it in their store and had to put their label on it, kind of like canceling out the bigger label, um, which makes me laugh because I've also seen after a company breaks away, I've seen their name cut out of labels. Um, so you'll see uh, the name, you know, uh, Meacham and, and then there's a triangle cut out of the label. And I always laugh at them, like, man, they really, you know, cut that person out. I just recently saw, too, and maybe some of you have seen that on some old uh, CDVs where they scratch out. I've seen people's faces scratched out, and I'm like, that's how they deleted somebody from their Facebook back in the day, I guess, by just scratching their face out right there. Um, but you can take a look at the labels. Um, some of them are really intricate labels. Some of them are very simple. These drums, most, most of these drums all have labels on the inside you can take a look at afterwards. Um, but that's basically what it looks like usually through the vent hole. Baltimore, um, you have Heinrich C. Eisenbrandt um, was a big manufacturer. William Boucher Jr. I for years said voucher. And then I heard um, George Wunderlich, um, who was the, um, he was at the uh, Civil War, I think, Museum of Medicine. Um, and he was talking about this guy named William Boucher who made banjos. And I'm like, who's that? And I'm like, I'm mispronouncing that guy's name for like three years. Um, but Boucher was a very prominent banjo maker um, in Baltimore during the war and you know, started to pick up making drums and uh, made a lot of money. Um, and you can see one of those eagles on the uh, bottom right hand side that he made. And then Francis Sauer, the Union Drum Manufacturing. Uh, a lot of these Baltimore drums, uh, no surprise, are falling into Confederate hands. And you can see a lot of those drums uh, being identified to various regiments in the South um, being shipped all over the place. And then my favorite, just because I'm a Pennsylvania guy, I guess, is Philadelphia. And you have tons of Germans uh, in Philadelphia at this time period and earlier. And uh, they brought a lot of those Cooperage skills with them and woodworking skills. So you have the William H. Horseman Company, uh, Conrad and Frederick Soisman, Charles Zimmerman, Ernest Vought, and Clement Brothers. Um, a lot of these are going to be found, these names are found on various other items. Horsemen had all sorts of military goods. Um, they've been around since the 1840s. Um, Horseman was a peasanteer uh, by trade. He had gone to France and learned about, you know, making cordage and making trimmings and all these fancy um, intricate um, lace and things like that. And then when they built up their store, they brought in all these looms, thousands of looms, built this humongous building and um, ended up make, starting to make drums as well. 
Um, they have a lithograph from 1866 that actually shows all the different rooms and what they were used for. And then they have their ledger books of all the guys that worked for them. And they had a drum maker there in the 1850s. And then they have a specific drum making room in their factory. Um, when you start to take a look at that. So this was a huge production. There's also um, newspaper reports saying that horsemen could have outfitted the entire country with drums in their drum shop, turning out thousands of drums. It's probably a little bit of uh, you know hyperbole, but to kind of say you know that they were making a lot of these instruments in shop. Uh, those are my favorite though to collect, I would have to say, um, any Philadelphia drum. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this. Um, Delavan S. Miller was a drummer in the 2nd New York Heavy Artillery. He wrote a, uh, a memoir after called Drum, Drum Taps Through Dixie. And he writes kind of an ode to the drum. And um, I, I just like this. It's just so nice because it talks about how he kind of looked with reverence at the drum as opposed to just, you know, this instrument. And he says, yes, I am a drum and a very old drum at that. My leather ears are twisted and brown. My shiny sides are scratched and marred. My once beautiful white head is patched and bloodstained. Yet I am loved and tenderly cared for, have my own cozy corner in the attic and am better provided for than many of the brave men who fought for the union. So I am content. I've lived my life, was ever ready for my duty, made lots of noise, have led men on the march and in battle. Now I am laid aside, growing old like all the boys of 61. So I always thought that that was a, a fitting tribute for a musician to give the instrument that they carried and probably took care of, you know, very tenderly uh, many times because when they had to get new articles for that drum, it came out of their pay. <laughs> so they weren't, you know, making sure like any other government issued equipment that that was, you know, well taken care of. So um, one more thing here, and then I want to play a little bit more music. Um, if you ever want to take a look and you're really interested and want to go down any rabbit holes with drums or have drums or see drums or want to know anything about them, um, like at the beginning here, um, I do have a website called Rudiments and Rope. Um, you can visit um, this website and you can take a look at any of the information on there. Um, I also do restorations. Um, if you have an older drum and by restorations, I don't do heavy restoration, stripping off the finishes or anything like that. Um, I like to do the most natural restoration as possible with limited amount of, you know, alterance to the condition of the instrument, but enough to make it sound to either display or um, to play. Um, but I do other leather work and, and things like that. But that's all um, on my website. So that's my shameless plug for the website. Uh, but I'm more interested in providing information um, about drums. And that's the majority of the website is about different drums and makers and lots of good high definition images. So um, I think I'll wrap up here. I'm going to invite one of my friends up here um, who's in our Fife and Drum Corps. He's going to uh, accompany me on the Fife. And uh, we're going to play a few of the tunes that I talked about earlier for you so you can hear them. And then um, I'll conclude and then you can come up and see anything you want and ask me any other questions. Mr. Craig Anderson here and give him a round of applause for coming out and helping me. Out. This is from the well old dip tin. <laughs>
I think my time is about up unless we want to stay for the next three hours and jam up here, okay. which we may do. Um, but I'd like to thank everybody. Um, hopefully, um, this was informative and interesting for you. Um, again, I'd like to thank John for having me out here. Um, this was a, a real treat for me uh, to be able to come out here and talk about this with everybody. And uh, feel free to come up and talk to me afterwards, ask any questions, and take a look at any of uh, the drums or equipment. I have an image over here, musician sword, uh, some music manuals, um, other things like that. But that is all for me. Thank you very much. I can do any questions anybody has one. Yes. I was wondering if you're going to collect them, do you have any Confederate drums? Yeah. yeah. So the, the question is, is uh, do I have any Confederate drums? So there's there's very, very few Confederate drums in circulation out there that are like identified as Confederate drums. Um, I had picked up one that was. Uh, that was mislabeled, they, they had said the last name wrong. Um, and I, I picked it up and um, it's, it was, it had a Richmond label in it and it was from a wartime maker there. Um, and I, I'm going back and forth with a couple people trying to determine if that label is real or if it's a forgery. So I might've been had on that one, but I'm not sure. <laughs> the jury's still out. But it's pretty, it's pretty rough looking. The drum is definitely old. Everything's pretty old. It's just the label that we're not sure of because we haven't seen that label before um, on a drum. So I don't know. It's a maybe, <laughs> which is a terrible way to answer. Yeah. Question, where's the bugle fit? So the bugle um, is going to kind of take over the field music as the war goes on. You're going to see the bugle is really prominent uh, later on. The bugle, I would say, is, is in early in the war, it really is for skirmishers, um, and it works very well for them because they're the ones that are out in front of the main line of infantry. So being able to commute commands to them to come back and forth, um, skirmish, there's a lot of skirmish signals for the bugle. Um, obviously, in the cavalry, you're going to have the bugle. Um, that's going to be very prominent. Um, but there were bugle marches during the Civil War where they had drums and bugles. And I, I believe it was uh, one of the Minnesota regiments had a drum and bugle corps, um, which was kind of an anomaly for the time because most of it was fife and drum corps. But they had buglers and drummers. So they had bugle marches that they would play. Um, but the bugle ends up taking over more and more. And, and I think the height of fife and drum kind of ends after the Civil War because then the bugle more or less takes over. But you could have had a bugler in there with the field music also, and we do see that in a lot of images um, where companies would have a bugler, um, but you see it more for skirmish use and things like that. Yes? You have a recording of the uh, Wake Up probably that you did for us and I could uh, acquire so that I could use it in my house. Yes, we have. <laughs> my Flight and Drum Corps actually has four CDs. Um, and if you go to um, Camp Chase Fifes and Drums, Dot org on the website there is uh four different volumes of cds and i think on at least two of them is the reveille and you can blare blare that as loud as you want <laughs> yeah can you say a word about how the drum is used to keep soldiers in step so one of the things from from a stylistic standpoint you'll hear is a heavy right hand accents usually on the downbeats of like one and two um, and the way that the seven stroke roll is described a lot of times is by playing, you have one, two with the left hand, then three, four with the right hand, five, six with the left hand, and then a very heavy stroke with the right. And those heavy strokes are supposed to be when you're placing your feet on the ground. Um, so anytime that you hear a lot of the accenting, you're going to hear a real heavy accenting on one and two of most of the measures. And that's really kind of putting it into the minds of the soldiers. When should my feet be hitting the ground? And of course, as time goes on, you know, the, 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 the step is 60 beats, 70 beats per minute in the 18th century, early 19th century. By the time of the Civil War, common time is 90. And I think quick time is 120. So that is moving. Um, most of that drumming would be very hard to play at 120. So, you know, that's, that's extremely fast. But, um, you know, with the accenting is definitely what, you know, the soldiers would listen for and the music 
um, is definitely accented in that way through the rudiments. The, the actual teaching of the rudiments is down. You want to hear? So I can show you. Yeah, I'll show you. Yeah, a couple of perspectives. Yeah. Then there's a rudiment called the paradiddle. Um, and the paradiddle is accented just on one. So when you play a flam paradiddle, it sounds like paradiddle, which would be a nice, easy way to teach it. So paradiddle. Um, so you have that word. So paradiddles together sound like this. Hear that accenting on the downbeats of one. Um, whenever you're playing any sort of. Um, in Bruce and Emmett, drummers and fighters guide, they call them quick steps or marches for the drum corps. You'll hear a firm accent on the downbeats again where your feet should be landing. You hear those heavy accents on the downbeats, and that's where your feet should be landing each time. Roger, can you yeah. can you turn the drum over and show us the snares? And can you and say what are they made of? How do they work exactly? So magnifies the sound of the drum. It almost makes it sound like there's more than one drum beat. Yeah, so these are the guts. Um look at these sheep intestine um, that are spun in the cylinders, and then they ride along the walking head, and that's what gives it reverberation. So when you pick that drum, you'll see that this reverberates on the bottom, and that's what really allows the drum to have that rattling sound and that drum to carry. Now, a lot of modern drums you'll hear have muffling on the insides. You'll see a lot of modern drums with a piece of fabric going across the top head. Never in any original image I've ever seen, I've ever seen anything like that, because all that is doing is dampening the sound, which is the last thing you would want to do with a military instrument is dampen the sound. You want that sound to carry as far as possible. So what you're going to have is you're going to have a really ringy instrument that to our modern ears is probably not as nice, especially indoors. But when you're outside and you're standing about 10 feet away, that ring kind of goes away and you can hear it very crisply. So that's why these drums are so loud and so ringy and the depth of them as well. Um, you know, helps with that. And the diameter, 16 inch diameter is kind of like the standard that we see with these drums. Um, and that's because a wider diameter drum, a deeper drum is going to have a louder sound that projects farther and farther um, across the camp. Um, and then, of course, some drums don't have strainers where you can adjust. This one does. A lot of the drums that I've seen on original simply have the guts coming out the other side and you adjust it by pulling it with your hand. Because this, of course, being cast brass is going to be an added expense. So if you're producing a thousand of these or have an order for 700, you can not have these, that's going to make you a little bit more money. Um, but it, what is amazing to me about the drum that I've seen is the sturdiness that they're built. Um, you would think these mass-produced drums, you know, they're churning them out by the thousands for the military, are going to be done cheaply, and it's really not. They are very sturdy, well-made instruments. Um, they're 150, 200 years old, and they're still completely together and playable. Um, so that really, I think, gives credence to the craftsmanship of these uh, makers and the pride that they took in making these instruments. And they weren't just turning out junk, you know, to give to the military to make a few bucks. Yes? How much would a drone have to cost? Uh, that varies on the time period that or the, the year. So at the beginning of the war, you start to see drums being um, sometimes a dollar 45 or $2. By the end of the war, I've seen them $7. Eight dollars. Um, so, depending upon you know the year of the war, they increase or decrease. Inflation. Let's take one more question. Then anyone else can come up and talk to Patrick after, or his son plays also. Yes, he kid. plays. He knows a lot of things. What drums were used for John Kennedy's um, field projection? In 1963. Was that practice also 100 years before that? The muffled drum, absolutely. That goes back to the Civil War. There's actually what they would do, and I can, I'll show you what they did on here actually. Um, funeral duty was one of the ceremonies um, that there's actually images of. 
Um, and what they would do is they would play the muffled drum. And the whole way that you would do a funeral ceremony is you would play usually um, a very slow, sad piece. Um, for example, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the dirge that it's called. It escapes me right now. Dead March in Psalm. That's going to be one of them. You play a dead march along the way, very slow, very sad. You would get to the grave. You would do the ceremony. And then the fights and drums would march out with something called Merry Men from the Grave. And that was a very happy, very jaunty um, sounding tune as they would march out. Um, but what they would do, muffling a drum looks just like this. This drag rope at the bottom um, was not just for carrying the drum on the march, but muffling a drum, the muffled drum was literally taking these guts, making them as loose as possible. And then you would take your drag rope and put it underneath like this. And then the sound of your drum, that's your muffled drum. So you would have, in essence, the way that it's written in the manuals to do this is you would have a muffled drum playing a long roll. And then all the other drummers would be playing the other the other drum parts. But this is pretty much what you would hear at a muffled drum. That would be what one drum plays. One would play the muffled drum. The rest would play the other drum part. And actually, in the manuals, they specify that. Um, but that's what you would hear. And that's exactly what they did. And that goes all the way back to the Civil War. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for coming out today. Thank you. 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 Thank you.